Hello class. This is supply and demand lesson number five. So this is the one where we talk about the two special cases where the uh, market moves out of equilibrium. You might remember in lesson four we did the uh, cases where you move from one equilibrium to another and there were four of those. An increase in the demand curve, decrease in the demand curve, increase in the supply curve, decrease in the supply curve. So these two special cases are where the uh, market doesn't clear. Price floors and price ceilings. Alright, so the first thing you need to figure out is, is the price floor or price ceiling going to be binding or non-binding? So sometimes students have a little trouble with this word, but basically binding means that it matters, that it actually does something in the market, and non-binding mean that means that it doesn't matter. So if it's non-binding, nothing happens, equilibrium occurs just as it did in lesson four. But if it's binding, then we move out of equilibrium and the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied move in opposite directions. All right, so let me get my image out of the way and uh, we can start. So this is what supply and demand looks like normally. You see an uh, equilibrium there. Now imagine that we, let me see if I can f find it, yeah, a price floor. Now I'm going to start with a price floor that's really low. So the rule about a price floor is, it's a, a law really that says the price may be above the floor but it can't be below the floor. So the, the most common e uh, example of a price floor would be like the minimum wage. You could pay some uh, unskilled worker $50 an hour if you wanted to. There's no law that prevents you from doing that. But you can't pay them $5 an hour because there's a law that says the price must be at least, I think it's $7.25 now or something like that. So the way I have it drawn here, the price floor is set below equilibrium. So this is an example of a price floor that's non-binding. It's non-binding because market forces or driving the price to PE and that's above the price floor which is allowed. Okay so now let's move the price floor a little bit higher. I hope you can see that in this case it's still non-binding because market forces are trying to drive us to PE and the price floor is still below that. Alright let's move it one more time. Here the price floor is set above equilibrium and this one will be binding. The reason is because market forces are trying to drive the price to PE but we got a law that says the price can't go below the price floor so this will move us out of equilibrium. Can you see this uh, point here? Here let me just draw it. Where the price floor hits a demand curve will generate a quantity demanded that's considerably less than where the price floor hits a supply curve and generates a quantity supplied over here. So in this case it will be binding and the market will be plagued with a surplus. Quantity supplied will be much greater than quantity demanded. Okay so that's a price floor. Now let's try the same thing with a price ceiling. So the price ceiling is sort of the opposite deal where you have a law that says the price may be below the ceiling but it cannot be above it. So uh, I've drawn the price ceiling kind of high and in this case this price ceiling will be non-binding. The reason is because market forces are trying to drive the price down to PE and there's no law that says the price can't be down there so uh, nothing happens. It's non-binding. This would be something like if President Obama said by executive order the price of gasoline may not be more than ten dollars a gallon. Well it's not more than ten dollars a gallon so it would be non-binding. Okay so let's move the price ceiling a little bit lower. Now I hope you can see that this will be binding because market forces are driving us to the equilibrium price but we're stuck down here on the price ceiling so this will be the quantity supply. Here let me see if I can draw it for you. Yeah there you go. In this case the quantity supplied is much less than the quantity demanded so in this case you would have a shortage. Now it might be a good idea to try to draw these things 
and uh, I think I can do that. Let me see if I can get this thing to come up. Yeah, can you see that? All right, so let's start with an example, let's say, of a minimum wage. Now, currently, the minimum wage is about, I don't know, $7 an hour, something like that. So let's just imagine, uh, for the sake of argument, that the equilibrium wage for unskilled workers is something less than the current minimum. Let's imagine it's about $6. And uh, we have currently on the books a law that sets the wage at, I think it's like 725 or 750 I don't know. Let's set it at 750 And let's say this is a price floor. So now we got a law that says the price can't go below this floor. So what happens is, is that the demand curve, that is the schedule of all the possible wages and the corresponding amounts of labor that would be hired, the demand curve doesn't change at all. But at the higher wage, fewer workers would be hired. So this is the quantity demanded. And of course, at the higher wage, more people would be attracted into the marketplace to try to find work than they would at $6. So at $7.50, there would be more people looking for work. And this is the quantity supplied. Notice that the supply curve and the demand curve both remain unchanged. So the uh, answers to a uh, question like this would be demand curve stays the same, supply curve stays the same, quantity demanded decreased, quantity supplied increased. Now the wage, what's happened to the wage I would never ask you because it's kind of subjective. It looks like, doesn't it? Doesn't it look like the wage has gone up from six to seven fifty? But remember, that's only happened for some workers. These workers down here, here we can draw them if you like. These workers down here all get a raise. They used to make six dollars an hour, and now they make seven fifty. But consider all these workers right here. What happened to these folks? These are all people who would like to work for seven dollars and a half an hour but who can't find work at all. So if you ask any one of those people uh, has, their, has their wages gone up or not they would probably be angry and say well no they've gotten laid off and they're not working at all. So what's actually happened to the wage depends on who you are whether you got a raise and maintained your job or whether you got laid off. Alright so that's a price floor. Now let's consider a price ceiling. So it'll take me a minute to redraw this. So in the case of a price ceiling, let's set the price ceiling uh, down here so it will be binding. And we'll put equilibrium up here. Now, this would be, a, we don't have any uh, really common examples of price ceilings at the moment, but uh, one that you've probably fantasized about would be the president comes on TV and uh, forces down the price of gasoline, something like that. So, uh, as I'm making this video, the price of gasoline is about three dollars and a quarter a gallon but maybe President Obama comes on TV and says hey it's an American to be there and the price should be only two dollars a gallon or less so that would be a binding price ceiling now I hope you can see that the demand curve for gasoline which is all the possible prices and the corresponding quantities demanded would stay exactly the same but at the lower price people would buy more gasoline that's the quantity demanded so the quantity demanded would increase but at the same time at this low price uh, the people who uh, drill for oil and refine the oil and transport the oil across the country wouldn't be too happy about two dollars a gallon and so the quantity supplied would be less only the really inexpensive oil would uh, 
get refined. So quantity supplied would go down. But look, the supply curve, which is the schedule of all the possible prices and the corresponding quantity supplies, stayed the same. So in this case, this price ceiling would be binding, and this would be a shortage. Can you see that? It's a shortage because the quantity demanded is much bigger than the quantity supplied. I don't think I drew it in the other case, but in the other case there would have been a surplus because the quantity supplied was greater than the quantity demanded. Alright, so here I am again. We'll get rid of this if I can figure out how. And uh, that's kind of it for this lesson. The next lesson will be to identify the correct movement with an example from current events or history. And what I think I'll do is uh, find some good examples from some old tests and uh, just set them up here. And what you really should do is look at the question, turn off the video, try to work up the answer yourself, and then check your work against the video. If you just watch me do it, you won't really learn. It requires practice. All these things require practice. All right. Good luck.